Good afternoon, evening, or morning, everyone, wherever you are. Welcome to the Monitoring Volta Performances at Scale presentation. My name is Ken, and I will be the moderator of this presentation. This task will be given by Matteo Scandolo. Matteo has been a very active participant in Volta for many years now. He has worked on every component in the Volta stack, including owners, the core, worth agent, uh, the adapters, BBSIM. Matteo is currently responsible for Volta performance measurements, which has given rise to this presentation. So this presentation will be about 20 minutes long. At the end of it, we'll have 15 to 20 minutes Q&A or some discussion. So without any further ado, let's Matteo start his presentation. You know. Thanks for the introduction, Ken. And welcome uh, uh, everyone to this talk. So uh, we've been tasked with testing Volta at scale. Um, and being uh, when I have a very small and non-profit company, uh, setting up uh, a scale lab on physical hardware was, of course, a non-starter for us. Um, so how did we solve that first uh, roadblock in our task? Uh, we took an OLT and a bunch of OENUs and we virtualized them uh, using Docker. Uh, what we did uh, was basically uh, taking all the capabilities of the software that we run uh, on the OLT and on the new, uh, abstract them uh, into a container, uh, and that includes uh, both these two devices, but also the emulation of the entire uh, possible passive optical network. So the tool that came out uh, of this uh, first effort um, is a broadband simulator is known in the community uh, with its acronym uh, BBSIM. And it basically virtualized the entire uh, OpenOLT and OpenOMCI stack. Uh, these are basically um, the two software agents that runs on the two devices, uh, on the OLT and on the uh, OMCI to let Volta control uh, these two devices uh, and program all the features that, that are available in the hardware. Um, a very big requirement of this simulator was that it needed to be highly scalable because of course was the base to test uh, the scale of the rest of the software. It needed to be fast, but most important, it needed to be uh, reliable. And with that, it means we needed to be sure that uh, it will behave in the same exact way anytime we run it, because that was the base uh, to build the rest of our testing infrastructure. Uh, it also needed to be flexible because, as you know, Volta is a pretty big project that can support multiple different use cases uh, that are not that straightforward. Uh, and we needed to be able to test all of them using this tool. Uh, we'll see later on what are the differences between uh, these workflows and why it's important to test all of them at scale and not just pick one for reference. Once we build this tool, um, we felt we were uh, in a pretty good position, uh, but then we started asking ourselves the question, can it really scale? Is it really uh, reliable? Uh, can we really use it to, uh, to test the rest of the stack? So what we did was to build um, a reflector for this simulator. So it's basically playing ping pong uh, against a wall. The reflector simply respond to any message that BBC generates uh, in a very, very quick way, uh, like a wall will do when you, when you throw a ball against it. It will just send you uh, or bounce the ball back to you. So there is basically no way uh, you can beat the wall. And using this approach, we, uh, we build uh, what we call BBR, the BBC reflector. Um, to go a little more in detail, anytime BBSIM uh, send a message out, this message goes through all the Volta components and then possibly through Onos and then in the apps and then come back through all these, all these hoops back to BBSIM. Uh, BBR doesn't have all this level of, of complexity, so it can respond to BBSIM much faster uh, than when we are using the, the entire stack to simply prove that BBSIM um, is not the bottleneck of our scale test. 
So we started uh, running this, uh, this reflector and improving on the DBC performance itself. And we are now at the point that uh, we can provision uh, push flows, authenticate, and give an IP to 1,000 devices in less than 17 seconds. Once we were confident uh, with our scaling tools, we started reasoning in what were the important things to, to measure at scale in Volta, and how could we do that in a reliable way so that uh, not only UNF could collect some results, but we could uh, publish guidelines for everyone uh, that wanted to run similar tests in their setup. Um, the first important thing was to define uh, a standard setup or at least uh, specify uh, what are the, the hardware capabilities we are relying on. Uh, that's because, of course, if you run the same test on your laptop or on a cluster of three very powerful servers, you'll get different results, and you need a way to, uh, to differentiate and to compare them. The other desirable thing is that the setup uh, you use to run a scale test uh, is as similar as possible as the setup um, that we suggest to use in production. That's because there is absolutely no value uh, in an abstract setup that no one will deploy. So what we are uh, uh, trying to do is to set up um, a Kubernetes cluster so that we can uh, eventually introduce uh, some node failure and restart containers and move them around, all things that will happen in a, in a production setup. Um, we want to run uh, with data persistence in place, because uh, again, that's something you, you really want to have in production so that we can start trying to stop and restart the data storage. We can mm, start to um, tear down uh, the message bus and see how the rest of the system uh, react at scale. Uh, the next important thing to do was uh, to define which were or which are the, the most important uh, step in our process. And we identified five of them. The first one uh, is the most straightforward, uh, is how long does it take for Volta to activate a number of ONUs? And this translates uh, in the hardware in really um, finding the ONUs that are attached to the network, uh, discovering their capabilities and storing them uh, inside Volta so that uh, Volta knows which kind of messages and which kind of requests it can push down uh, to the device. Now, uh, the second step is to report all of this information up to Onus. As you know, Onus is an open flow controller. It doesn't really know uh, anything about PON networks and the way it sees uh, Volta is basically like a big Ethernet switch. So the only thing that is actually reported from Volta to Onus are the uniports on the ONU devices and the NNI port uh, on the OLT device. Everything that is in between is hidden by Volta, but if we don't have uh, Onus seeing these two endpoints of the network, there is no way it can start processing flows and programming the, the optical network as we want it to. So as soon as, uh, as Onos knows about the pores, it will start uh, creating flows to connect them uh, and pushing down these flows uh, to Volta. So we started uh, looking at how much time does it take Onos to, push, to generate and push the flows to Volta and how long does it take Volta to send an acknowledgement for those flows back to Onos. The next natural step, once the network is provisioned, is that we need to authenticate our subscribers before giving them access um, to the entire network. And that uh, is a set of packets that uh, will be bounced between the subscriber and the radio server back and forth through the network. And so we want to know how long does it takes for all those subscribers to reach these states. And then the next, <clears throat> the next and last step uh, is to go through the DHCP process and give our subscriber um, an AP. And this is a little bit of, of a mixed stage between some more flows that are pushed as a result of authentication and some more packets that travel through our network. 
once we have the steps, uh, we also need to define what are the important metrics uh, to collect. And of course, the, uh, the first one we thought about was the execution time. How long does it take for each of these steps uh, to complete given a certain number of devices? But we also need to monitor uh, another set of information. That is, how does our system react to a bigger number? So uh, when we move from 100 devices to 500 devices, uh, does the number of database queries increase linearly? Uh, can we optimize something? It increases exponentially. Uh, same for number of keys that we're storing in the data store and the size of it. Uh, a very similar set of metrics can be collected uh, on the message bus. So how many messages, how many bytes, how big are these messages? Uh, is there anything that we need to do that to optimize uh, this, uh, this kind of communication mechanism? Uh, or did we do something wrong when we were uh, defining our APIs and so we have messages that will just become bigger and bigger and bigger as we scale up uh, the system. And then, uh, as last, well, you also need to make sure that as you scale up uh, the software, you're not hitting any, any constraint on, on the hardware itself. So uh, you need to make sure that you don't run out of memory, of CPU, and you need to make a measurement of, uh, given this amount of memory and these many CPUs, how many devices can I actually control? Uh, in that setup. So we were talking before um, about supporting uh, different workflows and configuration uh, in BBCM. The BBCM can, of course, emulate a different number of software new devices, a different number of phone ports, and you can uh, horizontally scale BBCM itself to emulate multiple OLTs. Uh, but there are a lot of features that Volta supports that are slightly different in the workflows for the uh, three operators we are targeting with this project. And uh, we'll go quickly uh, through those. So only one of our operators uh, use EPOL as an authentication mechanism. So we need to be able to configure both BBC and the scale test uh, to address that. In uh, uh, in the workflow for that same operator, the authentication will start automatically as soon as, as these EPOL flows are provisioned. And then we have uh, DHCP. Uh, for two of our operators, DHCP uh, will be handled within uh, Volta and Onos. So we need to create custom DHCP flows. And again, DHCP will start automatically uh, once those flows are pushed. Um, in, uh, in the case of the third operator, Deutsche Telekom, uh, DHCP is actually processed uh, outside uh, of a Volta pod. So the only thing we need to, uh, to configure for them is uh, the, the data plane flows. As you can see, as a result of this, um, of this, this different configuration, there is a wildly different number of flows that will be uh, provision into the device uh, for each of them. For example, for uh, uh, AT&T, we will have uh, two flows on, uh, on the OLT, and then we'll have six different flows for each subscriber. So as you can imagine, that number scales up uh, very, very quickly as you, as you scale up the number of the subscribers. Deutsche Telekom is, if you wish, from the Volta perspective, the simplest uh, use cases because there are not many authentication and DHCP packets that are flowing uh, through the network and we don't have custom flows uh, for any of them. So we only have four flows uh, per subscriber once everything is configured. Well, Tark Telecom uh, is probably the most complex workflow that we are targeting to support. Um, because there will be a, a slightly different mechanism to manage uh, multiple services, uh, for example, uh, internet, voice over IP, and video on demand. They'll all go through the same device and the same ports, but they'll use different priority bits in the traffic uh, to, categorize, uh, to categorize it. 
and so the number of flows will increase uh, by a lot because we'll, we will have uh, five flows for each subscriber for each service. So that depending on, uh, on the subscription plan that any subscriber will get will vary between five and 15 flows uh, for each subscriber. Now let's make uh, a practical example. So as soon as we plug an ONU uh, into the network, what happens is that this ONU starts sending messages to the LT, um, telling him that uh, it has been configured. And so uh, the LT relays this message to Volta, uh, Volta configures the capabilities on this device and then reports to the new port once. And that's all that happens uh, for the Deutsche Telekom workflow up to this point. When we look at the at and workflow, we have a very, very uh, similar behavior uh, in the new discovery phase. The port is reported to Onos. But as soon as Onos uh, recognizes this port because of the way uh, it has been configured, it will provision uh, any pull flow down into the new device. And as soon as the new has this, has this flows, it will be able to start sending out uh, these packets and these packets will travel through the entire stack from one host to a radio server and back uh, and there will be an exchange of seven eight packets depending on uh, on the state machine that is implemented for each subscriber so this gives you uh, a first view of why it is that important that the scale test address all of all of these different configurations Another um, example, maybe more meaningful, uh, is when we start to actually provision subscriber. By provision subscriber, we mean to uh, actually instruct Onus to create a real um, packet connection between the new device and whatever is the upstream device north of the OLT. So that happens with uh, what we generally refer to as the add subscriber call into Onus. And when Onus receives um, this call, then fetches some information from a user database and based on that provision, the data plane flows. This data plane flows basically contain uh, information for the various devices on how to tag and untag the traffic so that can be differentiated for each subscriber. And again, for the Deutsche Telekom workflow, this is a pretty simple case. We have just these four flows uh, that are pushed down uh, to the device and nothing else happened. At that point, the traffic will be able to go straight out of the OLT uh, toward the, the upstream device. When we look at uh, the at and workflow, the situation is slightly different. Because if you remember, we had that EPOL flow uh, lingering around. We need to go and remove it because that flow didn't contain any specific subscriber information because we didn't know which subscriber was connected behind that device yet. Uh, we'll know that only after authentication complete. So when authentication um, completes, we add the subscriber, we go and remove this flow from the device. Once that's happened, we start programming the data plane flows, but that's not everything that happens. We also put another EPOL flow. This time the EPOL flow has the CNS tag relative to that subscriber and we need that flow because the authentication will be will need to be uh, renewed every certain amount of time depending on the configuration of the device itself and we also need to push a flows specific for the DHCP packets packets because they have a treatment that is different from uh, from other packets and as for authentication once the device receive uh, the DHCP flows will be able to start uh, pushing out packets that will be relayed through the stack to Onus, to a DHCP server, and back again uh, through the stack. So as you can see, testing the same number uh, of devices across different workflow will result in a wildly different number of operation. And this will, uh, will get even more not noticeable and bigger uh, once we fully support the uh, Tark Telecom workflow in the scale test. The other uh, big challenge uh, we faced in the scale test, and to be honest, we were not expecting uh, to be bothered by this uh, as much as we were, um, 
is what is known to the world to the, as the Eisenberg effect. And that basically states that the very act of measurement or observing something directly alters the phenomenon you are investigating. What this means is in very, very simple term. Um, if you can see in the soccer field on the right, uh, we have two players and one of them is just passing the ball to the other one. That is a very, very simple operation and nothing can go wrong with it unless the referee is too close to the action to observe it. And at that point, if the referee is on the path of the ball, what happens is that the ball will bounce off the, the referee and the observer has changed the original behavior. We have seen this happening uh, when we were running logs at trace level, uh, so we needed to introduce um, some kind of log level management in the scale test uh, so we could only observe uh, the pieces that we needed to observe. Um, we added out of band uh, packet capture so that we can um, have a dump of everything that is going on the network without affecting its performances. Um, we had the ability to run custom debug images that may have just a few log messages uh, to debug a particular issue without affecting the performances of the rest of the system. <clears throat> and we introduced the ability to run memory and thread profile. Of course, uh, anytime you change one of, uh, of this setting, you are affecting uh, the result of the test, but as long as that's uh, as the desired and known, uh, that's fine for, and that is useful mostly to uh, chase down particular issues that will be uh, otherwise impossible to uh, reproduce and investigate. So uh, we've talked about a lot of abstract thing that we did, uh, but where do we stand now? Uh, at the moment, uh, through our um, uh, infrastructure driven by Jenkins, we have a set of periodic jobs to monitor the performances on the master branch. Uh, that allows us uh, to make sure no new feature or no refactoring uh, will actually make the performance worse. This already um, allowed us to catch uh, this performance regression uh, in two or three occasions and to quickly act and resolve them. And that's very, very important because if, if you can pinpoint um, performance decrease to a specific commit, it's generally fairly easy uh, to solve that issue. If you only run uh, this performance test before a release every four months, uh, then it becomes very, very hard to pinpoint uh, what, uh, what caused the performance regression. Uh, we run this test on the master branch uh, every four hours uh, for a, a set of uh, different configuration. Um, we support uh, different topologies. Uh, as you can see, every job is, uh, is named uh, with a, a similar scheme that is the number of OLTs, the number of PON ports, the number of ONU, followed by um, the workflow we are testing and uh, up to which point we are testing it. Uh, in the same way, uh, yeah, we support different workflows uh, and, and different stages. And as you can see, uh, we, can, we also support the testing for uh, multiple OLT devices in the same uh, Volta style. Every one of these jobs uh, can also be uh, triggered onto a custom set of images if we want to make sure uh, that a patch uh, will, not, uh, will not ruin the performances before merging it. Um, currently, we are working on uh, integrating this feature with uh, Garrett. Garrett is our uh, code management uh, tool. And basically, uh, you'll be able to uh, just comment uh, on a pull request saying scale test and that will automatically build the required image and run, and run the scale test uh, for you and re just report the result uh, back, to, back to Garrett as a pre-check verification. Um, what has 
all these um, all this infrastructure and all this effort uh, help us improve in the system. The first thing we were uh, able to introduce and validate doing scale testing was uh, uh, the MIB templating. Um, the MIB stands for uh, uh, Manage Identities and is basically the set of features that one or new devices can handle. Uh, so what it can really, what you can really configure at the device level. Now, since uh, um, traditionally in a, in a passive optical network, all this information uh, are fetched from the device anytime uh, you connect one of them. Since we uh, will know upfront which brand and which model and which serial number of devices you're going to use uh, into your network, we were able to create templates uh, of these capabilities for the devices that we support and it preload them uh, into the, the data store. Uh, this means that anytime a device comes up, uh, we can save 75% of the OMCI messages that we would exchange with that device and help it as a scale uh, a single adapter uh, from, to support uh, 200 or new devices. Um, this doesn't mean though that we cannot discover capabilities anymore on runtime. Uh, anytime a device connects, we will check in the data store if we already know the capabilities for that device, and if we don't, then we'll discover them. Uh, we were also able to uh, introduce an asynchronous RPC mechanism uh, in the core. This really allows um, a parallelization of operation on, uh, on the same device. Uh, and we were able to, uh, again, scale horizontally the open and new uh, adapter. This is something that is uh, uh, very, very easy to do um, when your components are stateless. Um, unluckily, given, uh, given our space, our components cannot be entirely stateless because um, the adapter needs to know uh, a very big amount of information uh, regarding the device, and we cannot even think about fetching all of this information from the data store anytime uh, a device contacts one adapter. So we needed to uh, pinpoint a certain device to a certain adapter and make sure that all the messages were related to that particular adapter. Uh, moving on, the next big, big thing uh, we tackled was uh, how we were up handling logs uh, in the core. And these were information that really came out from, uh, from the scale test, analyzing the logs and the various threads uh, we, were, um, we were creating and managing. Um, so it turns out we were storing too many information uh, into the same key in the data store. And that was forcing us to have uh, multiple logs on data that, uh, that could be separated. So we did that, and now uh, <clears throat> we were able to achieve uh, a way faster uh, flow processing given to uh, this new parallelization that we could achieve. Uh, and the last and most recent thing we were uh, able to catch and, and debug uh, was uh, an issue in the uh, OF agent and in honors in which we were sending out open flow messages that uh, were way too big uh, for the standard. Now, the open flow standard claims that every single message should be smaller than 64 kilobytes. This is generally a feature that not many switch uh, in, or controller implements, because by average, a switch has between 32 and 64 ports. But when we, uh, when we connect on us to the logical switch that Volt exposed, um, we can go up to two, 3,000 ports on a single switch. And with that amount of ports, it's very, very easy to get past the 64 uh, kilobyte limit. So we added support for uh, these multi-part messages um, in both open, the OpenFlow agent and Onos. And also, uh, we found a bottleneck in, uh, in the off agent uh, that was basically queuing uh, the message parsing of the OpenFlow messages coming. Uh, from us. So, uh, in, with all this effort, uh, to make a very short summary, we were able to scale 
uh, Volta up by one order of magnitude so far, and we expect to uh, keep doing uh, a very good and steady uh, progress now that we have all of this infrastructure in place. The other thing we tackled lately, and this is uh, very much a work in progress that is ongoing right now, is to uh, monitor the infrastructure. Um, so most of the open source tool, tools that we're using in Volta uh, already adopted uh, what is the standard uh, uh, tool for measuring uh, software nowadays, that is Prometheus. It's basically a key value store with a very well-defined uh, format to report metrics. And a lot of the components that we're using in Volta are already instrumented uh, with Prometheus support. For example, both ATCD and Kafka uh, are already supporting it. Uh, Prometheus comes uh, with what is called a node exporters that uh, let you get information uh, from the hardware itself. So you can get um, CPU and memory consumption for every container running on a particular node of your cluster. Uh, all of this information uh, are now currently visible uh, in a Grafana dashboard anytime you run a scale test in real time. So you can see for every step of the pipeline uh, what happens uh, to, uh, to every aspect uh, of, of the software and hardware. We are still uh, integrating the archiving of, of these artifacts so that they could be, um, uh, they, they could be queried um, out of band uh, when we go back and look at failed runs and, and try and figure out why. What is uh, still to do? Uh, we have been asked by our operators to do some infrastructure sizing, so taking the problem from uh, the opposite side. Uh, so saying, I want to use Volta to, um, to manage 30,000 ONUs distributed across 10 OLTs. How many servers do I need? How big my Kafka cluster should be? How big my ATCD cluster should be? How many open and new adapters should I, uh, should I deploy? Uh, can I do all of that? Uh, with a single Volta stack, or is better to run multiple Volta stacks uh, talking to the same ONOS? Uh, and so these are all uh, questions that we are uh, trying to answer. Uh, we, are, uh, we are now in the process of uh, releasing Volta 2.4. Um, it should be out in the next two or three weeks, uh, but this will be uh, the big task for Volta 2.5. At the same time, uh, one of our uh, ONU and OLT vendors uh, is putting a lot of effort to migrate from the um, Python version of the OpenNU adapter to a Golang-based version of the, of the OpenNU adapter. So we'll be focusing uh, from the very early stages in benchmarking the performances uh, of the new adapter so that we can compare uh, them with the existing one. Uh, we already have the first few numbers uh, and they look very, very promising, uh, but they are still uh, in a very preliminary phase of, of the development. So this is uh, everything I had to give you an overview of what is happening um, in, uh, in the Volta world when we talk about scale. Uh, I hope you found this um, this presentation interesting. Um, and if you have any questions, um, now I guess Ken and I are going to chat a little bit uh, about what we just said. But if you have any question after this talk, you can uh, find me on GitHub, uh, Slack, uh, uh, and Twitter uh, at Teone, or you can just send a mail at the btcm brigade at opennetworking.org. Uh, and that's definitely the best place to get more information uh, about testing Volt at scale. Okay, thank you, Matteo, for such a great presentation. I have a few questions uh, that uh, maybe we can uh, discuss. Uh, one of them is, 
can you provide certain details on the environment setup that you have, the hardware setup, in terms of how many servers you have, how many cores, memory, disk, uh, network? Okay, yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So uh, we're running the scale test uh, on a Kubernetes cluster that is made out of three nodes. Uh, each node is a physical dedicated server. Um, the specs of the servers are a, a fairly generous spec, but uh, nothing that you won't expect to find in a central office or in a data center. Um, mm -hmm. So each of them is running 20 CPU uh, that are Intel i5 and 128 gigabyte, uh, gigabyte of RAM. Uh, they mm -hmm. are directly connected uh, to each other through a management switch uh, via standard uh, uh, CAT6 mm -hmm. 1 gig Ethernet cable. So there is absolutely mm -hmm. nothing fancy there. Oh, that's great. Uh, so how long did it take to set up uh, that environment? Uh, so the environment, to set up a Kubernetes cluster is actually pretty uh, straightforward. Even mm -hmm. starting from scratch, uh, we already had the server around in the lab. Uh, they were pre-installed with a classic Ubuntu 18.04 mm -hmm. uh, server edition. Uh, you just need to have all of them uh, being able to communicate to each other on the same subnet. And then you can install Kubernetes of them uh, with uh, a plethora of different tools. Uh, we generally use uh, CubeSpray to install a multi-node cluster and KubeADM to install single node cluster, uh, but that's really not a prescription, a prescription because the Kubernetes you get is absolutely the same every way you, you decide to install it. And the Kubernetes version we are using is uh, 115. For now, we have plans mm -hmm. to upgrade to 118 uh, soon, but before being able to do that, there are some changes we needed to do in, uh, in the Helm charts to support the newer uh, Kubernetes API. Oh, okay. And part of that effort is also to move the Helm charts from Helm 2 that we're using now to Helm 3, because uh, mm -hmm. There have been some API changes that require uh, an upgrade on the Elm chart. Mm -hmm. So since you started uh, to do the, the scale testing, did you have to change the environment any time or just like the environment has remained as is? Uh, the environment has remained as is uh, since we first built. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, as you remember, we were originally running uh, the, the first tests we ran, we were running on a virtual Docker in Docker cluster. And mm -hmm. then from that, we moved to a virtual Kubernetes uh, cluster mm -hmm. with three nodes running on the same machine to uh, finally arrive to the production-like uh, setting. Mm -hmm. But any time we changed the environment was not because um, it's needed to touch the environment between different runs, just because we wanted to test it on, on a different setup. So uh, I think we set up this environment back in January uh, mm -hmm. and we haven't touched it since then. Uh, okay. We're basically just installing and uninstalling Volta uh, mm -hmm. and the TCD and wiping out all the data caches between runs to make sure that we start every time uh, from a very clean uh, environment, but we're not touching the cluster itself. Okay. Uh, have you run... Uh... Uh, some of the scale tests for a long period of time, not just to try to figure out like how many ONUs we can support, for example, but have them, but just let the environment run for a long, longer, longer period of time. Is that possible? Uh, that's definitely possible. Um, at NF, we think there is not a huge value of doing that uh, on a scale setup because mm -hmm. uh, once your devices are provisioned, mm -hmm. all the data traffic will go through the hardware. Mm -hmm. And we don't have hardware in a scale test because everything is emulated. So mm -hmm. nothing will actually happen in the system. Uh, mm -hmm. What we are doing uh, is mm -hmm. to build uh, what we call the SOAP pod that will have one physical OLT and three physical ONUs connected on two different PON ports. Mm -hmm. um, and we will have uh, that pod um, up and running for a long period of time uh, and 
we intend to set up a continuous deployment on that pod to make sure that we'll be able to migrate through um, through different Volta version and roll back and roll them back in case of failures. And since we know that the only way to fix things mm -hmm. is if you are directly affected uh, by them, uh, what will probably happen is that few of us in the office will be uh, physically connected to the internet through that soak pod. So if mm -hmm. someone breaks something, we'll be offline. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So, so you kind of allude to that uh, during your presentation. Uh, is there any performance target that you're trying to achieve or you're trying to measure the environment to see what the environment can provide in terms of, uh, of performance? Uh, so we're doing a little bit of both, but uh, we have uh, a requirement from uh, the service providers we're working with mm -hmm. uh, that is to be able uh, with uh, Volta 2.4 to scale up to um, a thousand device, a thousand or new devices uh, divided on two OLTs, because uh, mm -hmm. that's what they are uh, they are planning to use for a field trial later uh, in the year. So. That's the minimum mm -hmm. scale uh, that we need to achieve. Yeah. Is that the same for all the providers or, or it's only one provider that has that uh, requirement? Uh, so two providers uh, will actually roll out a field trial with 500 uh, um, subscribers on the same device. Uh, mm -hmm. Only one of them will uh, start with two devices. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, you plan to run all of them in the same Volta pod, right? With the yeah. same, okay. Yeah, we are, for now we're planning to uh, support all of them in the same uh, Volta stack. Okay, so, so in one Volta One instance of the core, mm -hmm. uh, one instance <clears throat> of the OpenFlow agent, uh, three mm -hmm. instances of Honos, um, one instance of the OpenOLT adapter, uh, three ATCD nodes, and uh, three Kafka nodes. Mm -hmm. And the all new adapter you will have, uh, uh, and we'll have probably eight uh, mm -hmm. open new adapter. That's n the number we are using now for uh, for the scale test. Okay, so so uh, what do you see as the current uh, bottleneck that once this is solved, uh, the performance will be much better after that? Is there any current bottleneck at this time? Uh, so what we are. Uh, we're just done investigating one uh, bottleneck uh, mm -hmm. in uh, the flow removal. Uh, that's why I was stressing before that it's so important to uh, to test different uh, workflows because they all have different needs that mm -hmm. will stress the system in uh, in different ways. Uh, so we spent the last couple of weeks chasing down um, these bottlenecks that was actually a lot of small bottlenecks across the system because there was something that wasn't quite right in Onos, something mm -hmm. that wasn't quite right in the OF agent. And so mm -hmm. when we were trying to remove a thousand flows at the same time, <clears throat> some mm -hmm. of them were timing out, causing then a waterfall uh, of mm -hmm. uh, timeouts. Uh, the next big uh, bottleneck that we are uh, uh, observing seems to be uh, the amount of packet in packet out. Uh, mm -hmm. when you trigger uh, authentication or DHCP for uh, multiple devices at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. We're still investigating that, but it seems to be pointing at a way in which we structure the data uh, in the OpenOLT adapter. Uh, mm -hmm. So probably splitting out uh, that data structure in multiple smaller data structure will uh, let us achieve a bigger parallelization uh, to uh, store the information, store and retrieve the information we need to forward uh, packets through the system. Okay. Uh, as part of your test, uh, because you show the, the workflows, do the, do the operator's workflow also have uh, cases where part of the system crash, for example, the, the read write call may crash or the adapter may crash or OF agent may crash. Does any of those uh, workflows include that? Uh, so we have all those tests um, as part of a functional uh, regression test that it's run uh, every night on the master branch. Uh, mm -hmm. We are not doing um, those observations yet during scale. Uh, 
uh, mm -hmm. but it's definitely something that is on the roadmap. So once we'll be consistently uh, sure that we can provision um, a thousand subscribers and move them through uh, through the workflow, we'll start mm -hmm. adding uh, these failure cases. One thing that I forgot to mention uh, before in the requirements is that mm -hmm. it's, it's not only provision a thousand subscriber, uh, but it's provision a thousand subscriber in less than five minutes. And oh, now in less this than five seems, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so now this seems um, a very big, um, a very big time when we think about a cloud environment uh, when we're mm -hmm. used to to it all, we can exchange a million messages in 30 mm -hmm. seconds. But when you talk uh, about hardware, um, you need to think that anytime you send a message, then the hardware takes a little time to react to it. And then mm -hmm. the hardware may be controlled in band and can be at 20 kilometers uh, from where your software runs. So there is an, mm -hmm. an extra uh, networking uh, latency. And when you talk about a thousand devices, you, we need to remember that each one you exchange something between, even with the MIP template, just to mm -hmm. configure uh, somewhere between 100 and 200 messages with mm -hmm. the software just to be configured at the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. So all, all of this information makes you think that five minutes are not that long time in this particular case. Yeah, that's correct. And currently, in, in terms of the DT, a use case which is a little bit simpler uh, with 1000 uh, or news uh, how long does it take to, to uh, our subscribers? At, at the moment in that use case uh, we are about three minutes and a half uh, to mm -hmm. provision everything that that we need to uh, to provision in the system mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first requirement that has been uh, uh, has been met and we are, mm -hmm. uh, that happened recently in the last couple of weeks and we're very very proud of it mm -hmm. um, so that that give us uh, one minute and a half that makes us feeling uh, positive about yeah. reaching the same requirement uh, for the at and workflow oh perfect for a 2.4 uh, mm -hmm. it will probably take a li little longer uh, for the dark telecom workflow given the extra complexity we have there. Mm -hmm. So the dark telecom is not targeted for 2.4, right? It's uh, after. Yeah, a preliminary support of the of all the features that we need uh, mm -hmm. is planned for a 2.4, uh, mm -hmm. but work on that scale, uh, we need to add the support for it uh, in BBC and mm -hmm. we need to Add support for it in uh, in the scale test side, because um, if if you go look in uh, into the needs and grids, uh, there are mm -hmm. a lot of things that are different in the Tark Telecom workflow than Deutsche Telecom uh, and and AT and T. Mm -hmm. The the most common example is that for uh, AT and T and and DT, all the traffic for the same subscriber use the same uh, customer and service tag. Mm -hmm. uh, while for the Tark Telecom use case, each subscriber can have up to four different couples of tags to identify its traffic. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really much more complex, both at the hardware level and then the software level. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a, maybe a final question. So is there any lesson learned uh, from uh, doing the low, for doing the scale testing? What have you? What have you learned since the start of it? So you have to, the, the first lesson is that uh, I was expecting um, all of these to be uh, much more like a learning curve. Instead, it mm -hmm. feels like a learning scale in which <laughs> yeah. anytime you climb a step, you're super happy, you start <laughs> running and celebrating just to hit your face on the next step. <laughs> and and, and yeah. it's really a process in which every time you um, you solve one bottleneck, it's just mm -hmm. to discover the next one because there, there is really not a limit uh, to which you can improve uh, a scale. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's always challenging what is the next thing uh, mm -hmm. that we can improve. Uh, 
And I have to say that is kind of an emotional uh, roller coaster. Days of pure <laughs> joys and days of yeah. desperation, staring at gigabytes of logs, <laughs> trying to understand what, what happened. Yes. And then because of the effect that we were talking about before, <clears throat> that you cannot have all the logs on mm -hmm. all the time, often yeah. is, oh, now this problem happened again, but I don't have that particular log message <laughs> that I need to investigate <laughs> this. Yeah, this case. That's, yeah that, that, that should be quite painful to, to do investigation uh, and the load. Yeah, but it, it's kind of a balance because being, mm -hmm. uh, it's painful on one side, but that means that when you actually find it and solve it, it's so yes. gratifying because it took true. that long to, to solve. Yeah. So if, if anyone there is uh, it's looking to get into scale testing and scale <laughs> improvement, be aware that it can be challenging at time, but it's definitely very, very rewarding. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so anything else uh, you would like to add? Uh, not much. Uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, I, I will just uh, send out a shout out that the, uh, uh, the BBC More Scale Brigade uh, in Volta is a, is a very friendly environment to work with. So if you are uh, interested in the topics, please uh, get in touch, uh, join our meetings that are every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific times. They are open to everyone that is interested in, in the project. Oh, perfect. So thanks a lot, Matteo, for the presentation. It was really awesome. And thanks everyone for attending. Thanks, Ken.